Okay, hi everybody. Good afternoon. Um, a very warm welcome to uh, to all of you to to SMU to the sixth floor of SMU, which is um, a good place to be on a uh, was it Tuesday afternoon, right? Um, so this is our roundtable discussion, which is the title of which is the promises and pitfalls of comparative research. Um, and what we're trying to, to work towards this afternoon is to look at ways of doing comparative urban research that are methodologically and conceptually generative, whatever that means. It's uh, quite a big task ahead of us, but, but we'll do our best, won't we, everybody? Um, this draws on, for those of you that weren't uh, with us for the morning session, this draws on a, uh, a wonderful keynote given by Eric Shepard and Helga Leitner this morning, where they were talking about uh, the importance, the sort of methodological approach that they're championing, which is all about conjunctural research, right, to, to try and develop a more comparative understanding. And I think the, the thinking behind this roundtable comes at various conjunctures within the uh, development of urban studies. And there is a uh, scalar dimension to this, which if you'll forgive me, I'll just take you through very quickly in, in my mind. Um, the first, at the most, at the biggest, sort of most macro, macro level, um, there have been a lot of calls recently within urban studies to, to try and work towards a more global urban studies, and that's to decenter the Anglo-American Academy, to think about what urban studies from different parts of the world, from different cities, might look like. So that's one aspect to it. The second aspect, which is why uh, all the workshop participants are here, is the emergence of the smart city over the past uh, you know, 10 years or so. Um, and the smart city has now become very much a dominant discourse within urban studies. And so when we're thinking about comparative research, what does, it what does it mean to think about comparative research through the lens of the smart city? And the third conjuncture, or the third aspect to this conjuncture, is our workshop. The fact that we have all these wonderful people here from around the world, some of them more jet-lagged than others, uh, all coming here to talk about smart cities. They're, all of us have been working on the same project in different cities over the past two or three years. And so to come together and actually talk about our findings, talk about what we've been learning about, and to try and spark new conversations that, that work towards some sort of comparative understanding. Okay, so that's the kind of framing of this, this roundtable, wh what we're trying to achieve uh, this afternoon, which is, again, I'll repeat, um, comparative urban research that's methodologically and conceptually generative. So we have uh, four fantastic speakers. We scoured the world and we came up the, with the best four that we could find uh, in front of you here. Um, so uh, I will just introduce you. What's so funny is, I, mean, I haven't started the jokes yet, you know. Um, I, I will start uh, from, uh, this will not be alphabetical, but I'll start with uh, the, the gentleman furthest from me, who is uh, Jean-Paul Addy. Uh, Jean-Paul is an associate professor at the Urban Studies Institute at Georgia State University in the US. Um, and he's particularly interested in the politics of infrastructure with a focus on questions uh, of infrastructural regionalism and temporality. And he's just published a fantastic paper on infrastructural regionalism, which I hope he will talk a little bit about later. Um, I should also add that the JP has arrived in Singapore for, at 2 a.m. this morning, so we might need a stretcher to, to get him out of here. <laughs> um, so, uh, Jean-Paul, um, next to him we have a man that needs very little in, by way of introduction, who is uh, Kevin Ward. Um, so, Kevin is Professor of Human Geography, and he's also Editor-in-Chief at Urban Geography, Professor of Human Geography at Manchester, I should say. Um, he has a very well-known and very well-respected reputation uh, for his work on comparative urbanism, municipal finance, policy mobility studies, and also urban governance. Next to him, we have the, the wonderful Sarah Moser. So Sarah is Associate Professor at the Department of Geography at McGill University, um, and she's also Director of the Urban Studies Program, and like myself, is actually an alumnus of the PhD program in uh, NUS Geography here. So um, we have two NU NUS uh, PhD alumni amongst us. Um, Sarah does some really interesting work on global trends to do with new cities that are built from scratch, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. So there's a, a strong sort of Islamic urbanism aspect to, to, her, uh, to her work. 
Um, and then finally, uh, just to my left here, we have uh, Sean Teo, who's, uh, Sean is one of the most promising uh, Singapore-based urban studies scholars that we have. Um, he is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Geography um, at NUS, and he's doing some really exciting work on critical urban governance and politics in Asia. Um, particularly, and when we're talking about comparative research, his two main field sites are um, London and Shenzhen in China. So if we're talking about comparison, then you know, Sean is, is really taking that to, to quite an extreme. Um, so maybe a quick round of applause just to, to welcome uh, a wonderful round table. So, <laughs> Kevin wants us to continue. Um, okay, so I have, so we have about 90 minutes or so for this session. My intention is that we spend maybe half of that me asking them questions and sort of promoting discussion amongst ourselves. Um, and then for the second 45 minutes, we can obviously open the floor up to, uh, to you guys and also to the people who are tuning in uh, via Zoom, okay? Um, I've prepared a, a few questions which I've shared with the, the speakers here, um, and I've broadly structured them into three areas, which is, the first is about thinking comparatively, um, the second is about doing comparative research, and then the third is about applying our comparative research. So I'm going to, in a very loose way, go through this kind of uh, structure with my, with my questions. Okay, so I'm going to start with, with, uh, with Kevin here and ask him uh, just to, to maybe uh, give us a bit of commentary, which in your view, what is the current state of play or what are some of the leading trends when it comes to comparative urban research? What are some of the most promising areas that you're seeing? Okay, so thanks, uh, Orlando, and thank everyone in the room and on Zoom for joining us today. <coughs> um, I've got a few notes, which I'll say now. Um, I mean, clearly, on one hand, um, in the social sciences, we talk about turns, and I guess one might think about a comparative turn over the last couple of decades in some bit of the social sciences. Um, and I guess this we can think about in two ways. On the one hand, I think one of the things people have done a bit more about is thinking about what it means to compare, what's involved, what academic labor might be involved in comparing. And then I guess secondly is just there is just more comparison taking place for better or worse um, between cities. And I guess I guess the, one of the things to think a bit about um, JP and I are writing a piece at the moment, and so this was fresh in my mind, is actually what comparative urbanism or comparative urban studies looks like differs both geographically, and I think we'll hear a bit more about that from the other panelists, but also in terms of your discipline. So I guess I take for granted, or have taken for granted perhaps, that this turn um, towards more comparative work, thinking about methods, for example, of comparative urban studies, is dominant. And actually, there are large bits of the social sciences where that is not the case, where actually the modes of comparison as an academic practice has largely remained unchanged. Um, and if you don't believe me, look in some of the urban journals where actually some of the ways in which cities are chosen to com be compared, and then the kinds of methodologies, I mean the link between concept and theories and methods, is exactly the same as you might have seen in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, I just think sometimes I have, and others may be in bits of geography and planning, have taken for granted that this renewed interest and challenging about what constitutes comparative urban studies is everywhere, and it's not. That said, I don't think that's the reason why uh, we're on a panel. I think the attention is largely on that bit, I say particularly of geography and planning, with maybe a little bit of political science and sociology, where there has been a rethinking about what is understood as comparison. Um, and there's a range of reasons why I think um, some people in some bits of the world have begun to rethink the notion of comparison. And I say, I would say the organizing principles for this turn is, is this sense about um, methodologies, but then also an ontology and epistemology of comparison. So that is, what is the objects of our comparison, and then how do we render them knowable? What methods do we use? And how does that actually challenge us to think differently about place, space, and scale, the kind of foundational elements of geography? Um, and again, I think this, what it looks like, that turn, varies depending on where you are geographically and intellectually. Um, there are a number of uh, reasons, I would say, or a areas, we talked about frontiers. Uh, Orlando asked to think about frontiers. I guess there are 
a number of ways in which different strands of work about thinking about comparison come together, I would say. So one is, uh, is the fact that actually, for better or worse, increasingly it appears that bits of the world are more connected. So the notion of actually existing interurban comparisons or exchange or learning or interurban referencing. So this notion about a kind of extrospective rather than introspective mode of policy making and the notion of what J and M Jacobs talked about, repeated instances. So smart cities might be one example of that, where it appears like in more and more of the world, we see similar things being named. Uh, so this idea that actually people who make policy in one way or another in different areas of policy making are themselves performing various forms of comparisons. So that's one trend I would say that people have been writing about and are interested that gets people to think differently about comparison. A second strand of work is one on kind of urban policy mobility studies and the kind of digital and material informational infrastructures that people have written about that again gets us, gets geographers and planners and others thinking about comparison. And I guess the third is this uh, de- and recentering of academic knowledge or the domesticating and provincialising of urban theories. And I guess that last strand is one which is both bigger than uh, comparison, it involves a kind of rethinking about all kinds of things in the world, but it's smaller than it's only, it's only part of this broader conversation about comparison. Um, and I guess the thing that strikes me when I sort of look across the piece around comparison is actually there's very little consent, I'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing, but there's very little consensus intellectually about what the future of comparative urban studies might be. And as I say, I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. It's not like we all appear when you read the different interventions that there's moving towards some future that's set out there. Um, and actually the more comparison, whether it's any of those three strands or other kinds of work that seems to be published, the less agreement, the less commensurability there seems to be about different theoretical positions. And again, when you get to the age I'm at, it does feel like some of these conversations are ones that have been had before and may well be had again. And that might be very good reasons for having those conversations at regular intervals. Um, so I guess what my general view is that what we've been seeing, I would say, is a set of uh, unruly conversations and dialogues. And I guess I don't see any, so one of the frontiers is I don't see any rush to render them more orderly. Um, I think celebrating the unruliness of engagement around what it means to compare, whether there be whether some cities are beyond compare, I think is a moot point. Um, yeah, I think there's, there are a number of tenets out there in the wider field um, about seeking to uh, manage uh, the way in which future comparisons might be performed. And I guess my own position is, actually, I think it's quite healthy to have those unruly comparisons done. Um, I also think that this idea of frontiers, clearly a geographical frontier, is about more unruly comparisons between different types of cities. So um, this notion of global urban studies, that's actually a shorthand. We don't really, when people say global urban studies or global urbanism, they don't really mean that. What they mean is there are bits of the world that traditionally have not been taken seriously as locations for theory building, and we need then to build them into the equation about thinking about the future of urban studies. So this is not about adding things in, it's not about either empirical or, in the words of Ananya Roy, citational alibis. It's actually saying, for example, in the work I've been doing in Cincinnati, what would it look like to start with a theory about accumulation from dispossession generated out of theory, cities of the global south, African cities, and how would that allow us to understand what's going on in Cincinnati, rather than starting with not that there's anything wrong with starting with Harvey or one of the kind of well-known theories of accumulation, for example. And it seems to me that's one of the challenges that's not just about broadening the empirical palette, but it's a challenge to people like me who is probably never going to work out of the small number of cities I work in, but can I also rethink my own position in theorizing from and using theories that generate elsewhere? I guess the final point I would make, which is where I my own interests have emerged over the last 10 years or so, 
in terms of thinking about manoeuvres is I still happen to think that uh, this notion of relational comparison is a useful foil for me thinking about the work I do in my own cities and how that allows us to understand past, presence and futures as relationally constituted. Um, and I think that's important because it gets us away from thinking about um, the kind of linear mode through which cities grow as if there's a kind of predisposed future that comes from a particular city's past and actually opening up the messiness of how cities get to where they are that brings in the sprawling sets of connections and relationships. And that's partly around absences as well as presences. So again, thinking a bit about the ways in which some cities come to not have a smart city <laughs> model uh, as is important uh, as having a study that looks at the notion of a smart city in the kind of repeated instances example. Um, and I think as part of that kind of relational comparison, thinking a bit about um, functional and formal equivalence, which is a kind of term that was used back in the 70s, is still important. So you know, there are two ways of research. There are a number of different strategies that people use. Uh, in my the kind of work I do around governance and financing. Uh, and one of them is to do the kind of uh, formal equivalence, which is basically to look at something named the same thing in multiple locations, which is great, but it kind of avo it means you actually lose sight of the kind of relationships that lead to the production of something called the innovative or the smart city. And actually, some notion of functional equivalence, which is actually what work does the notion of something, whether it's called a smart city or not, do in terms of putting forward a particular version of the future that's more about digital platform, internet things, is actually more useful. And this is often some of the challenges you have when you work across public affairs and political science, where they're very interested, for example, in comparing what city government is in different countries without really acknowledging that what is understood as city government may or may not be where you actually want to look. So in the case of Singapore, where it seems that city and nation are interchangeable, then looking at city government and comparing it with what city government is in England or Sweden or Italy seems to be missing the trick. If you're interested in the ways in which cities are governed, that seems a more interesting question to ask. And so I would think a project on smart cities or sustainable cities or healthy cities or age-friendly cities should actually be thinking about the underlying processes that you're interested in, not about these shorthands that are more about, as I say, formal com equivalence rather than functional equivalence. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Kevin. Um, JP, do you have anything to add as Kevin's collaborator on this, this piece of work? Uh, sure. So I think there's some things which I can pick off on uh, what Kevin said, but hopefully offer something in addition uh, to that as well. So the first thing I wanted to get a flag up was the importance of thinking about you know, where we're thinking about this question of comparison from and a number of different registers. Um, the first, I think, as Kevin has mentioned, the conversations around comparative urban studies, global urban studies, is situated in a particular space within the academy. And you know, we're all kind of situated in that space as well. So where we're thinking from and where, when we're engaging with these questions from matters. So when I'm kind of encountering some of these conversations around what comparative research is, it's really kind of situated in or amplified by current debates in critical urban studies around the strengths and limitations of planetary urbanization, post-colonial studies, um, assemblage um, methods and ontologies, and kind of queer refusal, refusals to capture within these broader sets of conversations. So. When we think about comparison, we're also thinking about the standing in for a broader set of conceptual but ultimately political debates about the work that we're doing uh, and where we're doing it from. So thinking back in to the keynote this morning and the idea of kind of conjunctural urbanism, I think one of the interesting things that comes up from Helga and Eric's presentation is how we go and engage with and start unpacking what the particular conjunctures that we're looking at how, how do we do that? And uh, I think, Orlando, to your question, like, is this everything? Like, how, do you, how do you kind of grapple with this? But we come at it with a, with a pre-existing set of disciplinary toolkits or 
occasionally multidisciplinary toolkits. We come at it with our own um, experiences, our own kind of intellectual and political dispositions that I think kind of is something which needs to be acknowledged when we're saying, well, what is important in a, in, in a particular conjunctural analysis? And I think something which was clear in the conversations that we had with Eric and Helga this morning is you know, spatial thinking, geographic thinking. And I think there's a reason why geography is kind of positioned disciplinarily at the heart of a lot of these conversations. So where we matter, sorry, where we think from dis in disciplinary terms matters, kind of the political context in which these conversations happening also matters. Again, kind of referencing uh, some, some of the points which Kevin had made. But I also want to think about where we think about comparison from as individuals. So something, again, which, which Helga had flagged at the outset of, uh, of the keynote talk and something which you know, Colin McFarland and others have talked about is that you know, all urban research is, is, to a certain degree, comparative. Like we think with elsewhere whether we're kind of explicitly doing this or not. And that has a couple of Im implications. I think it, the first is one of the things which has emerged with this comparative turn is an interest and desire to make explicit a lot of the implicit work that we do when we think about doing the work that we're doing. Even if it's on a single case study, it's inherently comparative because we're thinking about the places that we've been, the studies that we've done, uh, you know, um, you know, places that we've lived in, and, and these types of things. So kind of situating where we are, our positionality is important. Um, and from this, a second point that I'd like to make is a lot of the conversations and the framing around comparison are grappling with how do we negotiate issues of um, the general and the particular? Like, what is the, um, the conceptual elasticity of our theories and how we can apply them and move them in, in different contexts? But I'd like to suggest that if we're thinking about what are the, what's the state of affairs with comparative uh, research, we also need to kind of situate this between modesty and responsibility. So we have a sense that you know, different places are perhaps not unique, but they're worth, they ha they have in there's an inherent interest in thinking about and with a variety of different places. And to do that, I think, you know, when I think about the work that I do comparatively, my work is in the global north because those are the cities that I've lived in, uh, that I've experienced, and I don't have the capacity to go and do research in the global south without reproducing some problematic, exploitative forms of knowledge production or parachuting in. And I think there's, there's a danger to that, even if you are you're doing a project which lasts 10 years and you're kind of returning to the site. There's, I think there's a need for modesty in terms of our own ability to recognize and understand and, and gain an insight into an other place. Yet at the same time, I think that that need for modesty is balanced or, or doesn't negate the responsibility that we have to think about generating theories and concepts that have a broader degree of applicability that help us render, render the world intelligible and say something about the work that, that, we're, that we're doing. So the state of affairs in comparative research, I think it's very kind of an open, a, gener you know, a generative time, again, kind of you know, echoing Kevin, that the, the heterodox nature of comparative work is, I think, a, a benefit. It's good that we don't have a singular direction that we're going to. I think it's, uh, it's useful to situate where we are within these conversations and use that as a way to recognize and acknowledge the bounds and limitations of the concepts and the theories that we're using, both as individual researchers and in terms of the concepts that we're forwarding. And I think that goes for a, you know, a, a sensitivity to the local specificities of place, but also if we're thinking about broader, broader theories that are operating at a higher level of generality that are making claims about you know, capitalist urbanization. Um, as I think a lot of times that those types of conversations and those types of theories from the people who are articulating them aren't doing the work of erasure that other people see in them, but part of the challenge there is articulating the scope, the generality at which our concepts are being developed and deployed. And I think a, a, a conversation around comparative urbanism needs to be generative, as hopefully these conversations are, but they also need to be both generous and modest in terms of how we approach the conversations that we're having with each other intellectually, theoretically, politically, and in the field.
Great, thank you, JP. Um, I, it sort of strikes me from listening to both you and Kevin that this is quite an exciting interdisciplinary moment uh, in terms of uh, urban studies as well and sort of the potentials for, inter, for interdisciplinarity. Um, I want to, to pick up on one of the, the questions that actually JP posed in his response, which is where are these conversations coming from, um, and use that to direct the conversation to, to Sarah and Sean, um, which is, you know, what might it mean for us to take apparently alternative urban formations, whether it's new cities in the Middle East or, or, or um, anywhere else in the world, or perhaps Chinese cities. What does it mean to take these, as the, these areas as the starting points for our theorization and to build outwards from there, to develop a more um, a different understanding of traditional core periphery models of, of comparison? Um, Sean, do you want to go first? Thank you. Thanks, Orlando, for the question. Um, yeah, so I, I think that, that that's a really important question and, and a question I've been grappling with um, you know, for the past few years and, of course, even now in my research. I would start by saying that uh, in, 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 for those who are familiar with urban China or Chinese urban studies, uh, you know that there is this almost sort of agreement that urban China is quite exceptional to the point of it being you know, beyond compare. So for me, that was really the starting point of, of you know, thinking from China, but not just from, but with China as well. And, and of course, this principle can be applied to you know, any given city in the world, any given region. So that I think the first question to ask is, what is so unique but not exceptional about China? And I think the most obvious answer is the power of the state. Right, but I think rather than just saying the power of the state, we need to be more specific about it. So in my own work, I, I realize that it's not just the power of the state per se, but it's the power of individual officials, right, in the municipality or whether in the district government or different scales of government. So for me, the starting point was really thinking about to what extent could individual officials in China that constitutes the so-called power of the state Right, be relevant for more socially engaged or socially progressive forms of transformation. As we all know, China's in a moment um, whereby you know, President Xi Jinping is now trying to advocate for people-oriented urbanization. So what does that mean really? Right? So I think that was the starting point of my research and the first big question I wanted to ask. And where is the comparative moment then? So this is interesting because when I was in Shenzhen doing that pilot field research, I was also based in UCL in London, right? And reading the papers every day and, and reading stuff about London and austerity and, and all these kinds of things, you know, it, 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 gave, it, it gave me the idea that the local authority was, you know, quite powerless, you know, victims of austerity, couldn't do much um, in terms of, you know, community-led housing, which I was interested in. But I, I didn't really believe that narrative so much, right? So my work in, in, in Shenzhen really helped me to see the power of individuals and how especially they negotiated with certain segments of society. So in China, um, you know, municipal officials often have very close informal links with public intellectuals who are architects, academics, you know, who are all very interested in advocating for the marginalized, and in my case, I was studying urban villages, right, informal settlements that house, uh, you know, a majority of Shenzhen's migrants. So I was really interested in, in this question, right? So rather than taking, you know, neoliberalism or austerity or localism as this starting, stricturing, theoretical framework to think about state-society relations, I, I saw in Shenzhen, and not even in China, because people would argue that this Shenzhen moment was quite unique, exceptional as well. Right. I, I took the case in Shenzhen as a starting point rather than China's model of authoritarianism or state entrepreneurialism you know, as, as a kind of a guiding principle for me to think about things in London as well. And, and that really helped me to see how even in London, right, and um, this was in Lewisham in Southeast London where I studied, uh, and Lewisham was interesting because Lewisham Council became the first council in London to successfully create a pilot model for affordable community-led housing, which, which did, you know, to some extent, influence the development of the sector in London as well as in the UK more generally. So, 
I think this, is, this, this short example is a really good example of how rather than starting from the usual suspects of the global north, you know, where I was based and, you know, where I was being fed with messages of, of, of you know, the inability of the local authority to affect anything, you know, and local authorities just being, uh, you know, mi middle people for austerity, passing on cuts to the community. You know, I was, I was able to, from my research in Shenzhen, be more explicit in trying to tease out how local authority officials had some power, you know, however residual they were, to work within the systems and the planning institutions in London to effect some kind of change. And that was, you know, kind of largely influenced and inspired by my work in Shenzhen. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I, my voice isn't that great, but I think I'm understandable. <laughs> um, I do work on new master plan cities. Uh, there are about 160 in uh, over 45 or 50 countries right now, so it's a global trend just in the last 20 years. Uh, so it's really rich, fertile ground for making interesting comparisons. It's sort of really inherently comparative. Um, and the, they're all almost all based in the global south or emerging economies or whatever we want to call them. Uh, Korea uh, uh, is one example of a more, you know, wealthy nation that's building uh, new cities. Um, but the rest are in Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, Latin America, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, and so I guess I come at this looking at sort of the particularities of this phenomenon versus the broad trends. Um, and for me, Europe, I don't look at Europe. Europe is sort of this area at the edge of Africa and Asia that <laughs> I've heard about, but <laughs> I don't know anything about. Uh, and the US is even more distant, although I'm based in Canada. So all my work is really looking at sort of circulations between the Gulf, um, between East Asia, between Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, so I guess I'm driven by sort of some key questions in my little field, my little subfield that I can speak to. Um, and so I'll just run through some of these um, that are maybe directions for future research, but also questions I'm interested in, in right now. Um, so why is this moment such a fertile ground for new city ideas uh, and schemes? Um, what domestic and global forces have aligned to make the creation of new cities so seductive? And who are the actors facilitating the creation of new cities? Uh, both domestic and foreign, both public and private, and what are the kinds of geopolitics that result? Um, so one quick example is uh, the Korea Land and Housing Corporation, or LH. They're building a city in Kuwait, a smart city in Kuwait, and they had plans to build one in Brazil. And, you know, Korea's all over the place, and everyone talks about the Singapore model, and very few people are talking about Korea as an exporter of a particular type of smart urbanism. Um, and likewise, Malaysia is uh, a huge exporter of a particular Malaysia model that uh, we have a very good scholar working on right now at the Asia Research Institute. <laughs> um, uh, what is being built and for whom? Uh, who is being physically or symbolically excluded? Uh, what sorts of uh, places are actually being created? Uh, are these a vision of the future or a vision of the past and which past? Uh, so that kind of touches on my work on comparing uh, Muslim-dominated places in Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Gulf, uh, which are all, to, some, to varying extents, engaging with certain interpretations of Islam in a lot of new city projects. Um, I can go on about that, but I'll go to the next series of questions. Uh, what are the legal mechanisms that allow new cities to get off the drawing board and what sorts of colonial structures, laws, or other legacies are uh, shaping these projects? Um, who's creating these visions? What policies or ideas are being circulated transnationally? Uh, and which models or antecedents are being looked to for inspiration? Uh, again, uh, it's coming from all sorts of unexpected places. Nobody's thinking about London or uh, in New York or Chicago or, or any of these kind of uh, global cities, uh, in my research anyway. Uh, and then what rhetoric is being employed to promote and legitimize these projects and why? Uh, how are globally circulating terms such as smart and green and uh, eco interpret in interpreted in very different ways? 
Um, and then what are, how are locals resisting and challenging these projects? Um, I'm really interested in the comparison of colonial uh, legal legacies, particularly between Canada and Johor, which has you know, many of the same uh, you know, legal, similar rooted legal system. Um, right now, indigenous people in Johor are fighting back against uh, urban mega developments using Canadian uh, indigenous legal precedents. So I'm, in, I'm kind of interested in how there's an interplay between uh, former colonies. And then finally, uh, what places do not have city smart, uh, smart city projects underway and why? Um, because if there are about 50 countries with these projects underway, what are the ones that are resisting this? And uh, what unique features do they have uh, that are allowing them to resist this sort of seductive trend? Um, so I'm going to end it there. Great. Thank you, um, Sarah. So actually, building on the idea of new cities where there's an assumption of, of emptiness before, which is obviously problematic, but it's also quite an interesting starting point, um, I want to talk a little bit about genealogy and the sort of uh, bring this into conversation with, with why we're all here um, during this workshop, which is to talk about smart cities. Um, and obviously, the idea of a smart city has a certain... Uh, marks a certain point in time, and there's obviously cities before smart cities, but then there is some sort of change that needs to, to be affected in order for a city to become smart in various ways. Um, so I guess, you know, to phrase this as a question, the question is what is the role or importance of comparative urban research in an era of smart cities? Um, and maybe I can direct that to JP, because I think you've got some uh, interesting things to say about this idea of genealogy and time and, and things like that. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll take up the invitation to talk about temporal things and a couple of different registers. Um, the first, I think, is bringing up, but it's kind of shifting some of the th some of the conversations which initially came up in the uh, again in the in the keynotes where Helga and Eric were stressing the importance of spatio-temporal thinking with an emphasis of you know, we need to bring questions of spatiality to conjunctural analysis, which is you know, typically thinking about the, uh, kind of these genealogies of, of, of time, but bringing up, bringing up the questions and dynamics of time, I think, are uh, useful and instructive for smart cities in a couple of different ways. The first, I think, has been mentioned by Kevin and Sarah already, which is thinking about what does the discourse of smart cities tell us about the relationships between the past, the present, and the future? And it's like Kevin Ward's, no, Kevin, you're Kevin Ward. Um, Rob Kitchen is also bald. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and white. And, and old. Yes. That's a good comparison. Yep. <laughs> um, so you're, you're Rob Kitchen's done some, I think, you're, you're seminal work thinking about the timescapes of smart cities, which brings some of these questions to the fore where we think about the relationship between, you know, the present, the future, how do we think about forecasting smartness? How do we think about backcasting from the imagined utopian urban, uh, smart urban future that we're thinking about? But also grounding this in a sense that we're coming from particular paths and particular places, and these are geographically, um, um, contextually specific and contingent. So we have these, these broader questions about what is the work that smart cities are doing beyond their immediate kind of um, technocratic interventions, like how are they enabling us to imagine the future, to um, do the work of infrastructure in pre present, uh, presenting the future, both in terms of you know, displaying it, but also bringing that future into the current instance. And we can shift gears now to think about what, what, does, what, does smart, what does smart conversations tend to do with the ways in which governance is practiced and these things are operationalized. A lot of smart technologies are about real-time governance, about collapsing the, um, the, the temporal distance between the production of data, its utilization, its application, its feeding into various, uh, various urban systems, um, often down to milliseconds if we're thinking about the responsiveness of particular technologies. And that raises some interesting questions about how we think about the practice and performance of urban governance being drawn towards a perpetual present where real-time data, real-time data analytics bring us into a current now that challenges some of these 
future projections about notions of futurity and modernity, like it does the smart city in, in a sense kind of negate um, that particular modernist longing for a utopian future if we're living and experiencing and governing the city in the present instance. Um, so there's, I think, you know, temporal dimensions to think about when the smart city is practiced. And thinking about some current work in, uh, in infrastructure scholarship, there's the question of you know, you know, when is infrastructure in addition to what is it? So what is the smart city, but also when is the smart city? When is it actualized? When does it exist? Is it something which is practiced and performed in the present? Is it something which is projected into the future and aspired to without necessarily being operationalized uh, and realized in, in practice. So that question of when is the smart city, I think is something which is useful to um, engage with in a comparative, uh, in comparative manner across the case cities. And that brings me to the last point that I want to make on, on, on notions of time, which is also thinking about when is comparison, like when is the comparative moment in the studies that we're doing, that we're thinking about. Um, Again, jumping back to some of the ideas that come with the keynote, is the comparative moment being foregrounded at the outset of a study to give us a set of parameters to think about? Um, is it something which uh, Montero, and Mon Montero and Balucci recently, recently argued about um, where we can do a posteriori comparison, where we do the studies and then we come together and do something which we would normally, you know, has been done a whole bunch of times already, but we're putting an explicit name, it, name to it where we have two, two case studies and then we bring them together and compare them and that gives us a, a different um, temporal dynamic methodologically in terms of how we think about engaging and bringing smart cities into dialogue. And ultimately I think there's a, there's a challenge here which the comparative turn, this, 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 these arguments around global urban studies have asked us, as Jenny, Robin has said, Jenny Robinson has said, to think through cities elsewhere, to engage with el other, other wares, other elsewheres when we're doing stuff. But I think there's a lot of interesting and generative stuff which we can do comparatively by thinking through elsewhens as well as elsewheres. Great stuff. Thank you, JP. So um, I'm mindful of the time and time and it's uh, racing away from us. Um, we're coming up to 42 minutes. What I'm going to do is uh, ask one more question, um, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor for, for you guys to ask your questions, uh, including those who are tuning in via Zoom. So, so please be ready uh, after this uh, question and round of responses. Um, I'm not going to direct this at anyone, but you can, any of you can jump on it and, and tear it apart as much as you want. Um, but thinking again about the, the, present, the, the idea of time and the present moment, um, and this is me jumping to my applying section of my questions, um, but actually thinking about COVID. Uh, and that has been a defining moment uh, in all of our lives, which is still, the effects of which are still being felt uh, in various ways, in various degrees, uh, but they're still being felt in cities and in non-cities um, throughout the world. So I guess in some respects, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic has been a great equalizer for cities, making them, providing a sort of connective thread of experience that connects cities around the world. Um, but obviously responses to the pandemic have been uh, variegated uh, throughout the world as well. I guess now that we're moving, we're slowly moving towards a post-pandemic future, what does this mean for comparative urban research? Um, so I'll leave it out there and you can, answer as you, or respond as you wish. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure it's, I guess my, my initial response when I saw um, the question, or when you prompted me, is it seems to be it's the great unequalizer. Um, and intra and interurban uh, differences in equalities along all kinds of vectors have been revealed, if they weren't already there. And I guess that then asks questions of us in terms of the ethics and responsibility about doing comparisons. I think that was always the case, but it's just become a bit more pronounced or we've been reminded of it because, yeah, the kind of consequences of COVID, again, COVID past, COVID presence and COVID futures, we're not, there's no past there's no kind of few past COVID. It will remain present. Um, and yeah, it's prefigure. I mean, I guess it's prefiguring uh, futures. Um, yeah, that are, that, that, that simplifies, amplify and accelerate pre-existing trends. So I 
talk about infrastructural inheritances in the cities in which I work. And I think that's been, we've been reminded of that. And whether they're digital or material, green or blue, those kind of inheritances are incredibly important. And again, they've been reminded of that with, um, with COVID-19, I'd say. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Sean, maybe I can push you to say something, maybe from a, a personal research perspective, because obviously Sean works on China, and, and he was just telling me earlier that he can't go to China, right? <laughs> um, so maybe you can just comment you know, personally on, on how it's... Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say two things. I mean, one from a maybe intellectual point of view and one from a very pragmatic, personal point of view. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, I think... I think COVID, like what Kevin has said, you know, when I first saw the question, I was like, the great equalizer, really? I, I mean, I personally didn't agree as well. But I, what, I, what I think is that the very fact that COVID reveals very, very different fractures and, and of course, different ways in which cities have been fractured post-COVID, um, it, it actually makes for good potential comparison. Because I, I'm personally of the belief that, you know, thinking through difference is, is very productive. Um, and, you know, when we think about setting up comparative experiments, like what Jean-Paul said, you know, when is the comparative moment? It, you know, for me, one of the ways is, is to set it up very, very uh, broadly, you know, leaving it very open at the start, but uh, leaving room for serendipity as well. So the, the thing about COVID-19 then is that, you know, you can easily look at two cases or more, that have been affected by the pandemic, but clearly the effects and the effects of the pandemic are very, very different. So I'll just give an example um, from recent research that has come out from China, not my own, but recent research that has come out from China. Um, they're now looking at how local governments in China are reacting to informal elements in the city, such as street vendors, for example, because COVID has forced governments to now, um, you know, almost market street vendors and, and, and allow them and support them in coming and returning onto the streets again because street vendors are now being used as a tool to return life to the city whereas pre-COVID, street vendors were aggressively policed and, and, you know, tr and, and basically kept off the streets in the whole name of modernization, aestheticization. So I, I could imagine you know, comparing different cities in China, so, sort of like an intra-national comparison or even you know, um, between China and other cities that obviously have street vendors and informal livelihoods as well. I think that would be really, really interesting. Um, from a personal point of view, yeah, I mean, COVID has been frustrating for me especially because, um, as you all know, you still, we still can't return to China, not even for holiday and much less for research and work. Uh, even if I, if I could return, I, I'm guessing that respondents and potential people that I would normally speak to would be, you know, far busier with getting their lives back on track, you know, given that the whole nation's been in lockdown. So, in a serendipitous kind of way, it's forced me to look beyond China as well, right? To look beyond China, I'm potentially looking at uh, Taiwan or, you know, somewhere else in Southeast Asia. And I think that, that works really, really well for me in terms of building a, a wider portfolio of you know, comparative research, uh, looking at similar things, but in very different contexts and in very different manifestations. So who knows, you know, in, in the future, I could have a, a nice book, maybe, you know, thinking about uh, cases from London, Shenzhen, the Taipei, you know, Singapore, and maybe somewhere else in Southeast Asia, Jakarta. You know, that, that could be a nice comparative thought experiment. Thank you, Sean. Um, so, as I, I did warn you, um, now it's over to you guys to, to do the questioning. So, um, if you do have a question, there are two microphones at either side. So, if you want to stand up and um, ask it. Uh, yeah, do you, you can just uh, go and, and stand up and, and go to the microphone. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. It'd be great. Sorry, if you could just introduce yourself as yeah, well. Sure, That'd be sure, great. sure. Uh, my name is Yong Zhang. I'm a, I'm a PhD student of Kevin Ward when I was in Manchester, but now I'm, I'm lecturing at the Yale US in Urban Studies. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I have a question for uh, mainly Kevin, but o o o of course to all the other uh, peer guests here. So when you are thinking about we can make full use of the comparable uh, lens to understand you know, for example, urban, uh, like smart urbanism, right? You mentioned specifically, like, we, uh, we can understand why 
uh, for example, like uh, smart urbanism didn't take place in some certain cities or you know, in, in some certain areas. So when we, can we really use like uh, compared to urbanism to understand something that hasn't happened? Like what, what are you trying to say? Are you alerting to something like intentional omission or it's unintentional result? I was trying to understand that part, thank you. Okay, I mean, Sarah talked about her own work and where there's uh, new cities are and where they're not. Um, I guess there's a difference between a, an absent absence and a present absence, and actually some of those things are not knowable in advance about where something's been discussed and doesn't exist. So you talk about maybe a smart city and the consequent, I mean, so JP talked about the work that smart cities does. It's a bit like bidding for a sporting event or a cultural event. It does work even if it never materializes, for example. And that's certainly the case in my own city of Manchester. So those places around the world that are bidding for World Cups or Olympics, again, maybe the end game is not to have one and it never materializes. You're not going to compare what an Olympic project might look like in four cities, but the work that it does locally. So again, in my own work, it's just around financing. Some of that's about disciplining people locally, si subjects when you're thinking about municipal finance. So I do think, although I don't think it's easy, sometimes actually thinking about those absences. And actually, often they are intertwined with presences when you're comparing. And so the example of smart cities is partly around the benefits. I think there are benefits about that kind of equivalence where you're comparing a smart city in one city with something that's been labelled by people, a smart city to another. But there's also something to be said by the kind of work that calling something a smart city does, standing in for a broader set of changes in service delivery or digital platforms or dashboards or internet of things or sensors. Whether there's actually something ever called the smart city in a city, it's a moot point on one level. Actually getting into why those things have been produced seems to be quite interesting. Oh, hello. Sorry, some people have joined me behind, so. Um, actually, Kevin, on that note, we do have a question from one of the people behind us uh, from uh, on the uh, attending via Zoom. Um, so, Sung BB, if you're there um, on Zoom, uh, you can ask your question in person. I believe there's been a request to ask it in person. Yes. Hi. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, Are we you can. Able? Okay, great. Hi, I'm BB from James Cook University, Singapore. Uh, so I have a question about, um, in Singapore, government tends to talk about the smart city as our solution uh, in terms of building a resilient city, especially a resilience towards an uncertain future. So we, as uh, the first uh, person who asked the question talks about. And I just want to uh, know, like in terms of your research, anyone in the panel, uh, on comparative uh, studies, how does this bear out in your research? Like, do you, is there evidence of any city that talks about being a smart city as a way of uh, building resilience, uh, especially towards an uncertain future? JP. What a guy. So, well, I'm not an expert on this. I, w I will say that uh, f from, um, from the knowledge that I do have, I think that that connection between smartness and resiliency is a relatively kind of recurrent trope. I think what's interesting about the notion of resiliency then is, is what does this mean and what questions are you asking about resiliency? So I was... Um, before I came, I was reading Tom Slater's late, latest book, um, Shaking Up the City, which has a chapter which is kind of like discussing the spread of resiliency as a trope in a, a kind of policy discourse. And there's a, there's the, the idea of resiliency as a normative good, that we want to be resilient, that the future is uncertain, and therefore the ability to uh, adapt or bounce back to, to um, internal or, ex or external shocks is something which cities should be preparing for and you can kind of see a, uh, a field industry of Arabs and KPMGs kind of circulating uh, resiliency plans or cities kind of instituting resiliency officers which 
you know, to a certain extent, may or may not be kind of engaging with smart city technologies or discourses or narratives. But the, I think the interesting question which Slater ends up posing when we're thinking about resiliency is some of the potential um, negative consequences of this type of discursive framing where if you are resilient, um, people can do things to you. Like you can take on um, greater forms of inequity because you are resilient. You can um, you know, put yourself under additional stresses because you have the resiliency to understand and accommodate this type of thing. And I think um, thinking about Slater's example, he talks about Glasgow where they've you know, put a whole bunch of money into developing a resiliency plan, but the plan itself says, hey, they, well, the people in the east end of Glasgow are resilient because they've gone and survived uh, you know, you know, post, you know, the impacts of post-industrialization, like they're a resilient people in Glasgow. Well, how then do you feel about the imposition of a resiliency plan or people coming in top down telling you what resilience can do and the, the implications um, that arise there in terms of the tolerances of particular communities that pre-exist to deal with you know, what, whatever an uncertain future kind of holds. So that's perhaps a, a tangential thing, but I think the point that I want to make is the idea of resiliency being raised around smart city agendas um, has kind of a normative connection, but there's also kind of political questions which we need to kind of think about and probe when understanding how these things are being kind of put into practice or discursively put into practice. Thanks for the question. It made me think about what's going on in the Gulf states right now and how smart and resilience and sustainability, they're all being interpreted in very economic terms. And it's more about, uh, you know, being smart and surviving the end of oil, being resilient and sustainable uh, to not collapse when, you know, the, the, we reach peak oil. So it's more about I guess discourses of national survival and diversifying economies away from oil. Uh, and that's, I think, maybe a particularly interesting example of how those smart resilience rhetoric is uh, tied together. Thanks both. Um, okay, we, we have uh, on Zoom, we have Ricardo Cardoso, who I believe is from Yale and US, who has a question about the city-centeredness of comparative urban research. Um, Ricardo, I don't know if you're okay. Yeah, you are. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm sorry that I cannot be there. Um, so I have a question, yeah, about the city-centeredness about of comparative urban research was the best way I had to describe the question that I had. So it's interesting to me how in kind of like talking about the promises and pitfalls of comparative urban research, we tend to get stuck to this sort of image and idea of the city, right? And I, I think this, this came through a little bit in a way you know, everyone talked about uh, you know their problems and their and their and their questions in the beginning. Global urban studies is about including these neglected cities in the infrastructure of theorizing. It's about generating concepts from the experiences that of cities that are off the map. So the question that I have actually is about sort of like the processes that actually connect cities. And of course, there's you know comparative urban research that also thinks about this. Not just the ideas and the policy that, of course, you know, Kevin uh, knows a lot about, but the people, the resources, the infrastructure, um, you know, the things, the materiality that actually interconnect cities and indeed make the contemporary urban city, the contemporary urban experience, sorry, kind of like deeply global, right? So the global is not just that it is about including these other cities, but about something, you know, there is the there's a, a global presence in our local experience. And I mean, I cannot think of a better of a better example than the city that we live in, Singapore that is. So I guess my question is for anyone that wants to answer or think about this, is whether we are stuck with the language of planetary urbanization to think about these type of processes, or if comparative urban research can play a role here that that goes beyond sort of like that, uh, you know, uh, what sometimes I find rather limiting ways of thinking uh, about the urban uh, from sort of like a planetary urbanization perspective. That was the question. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, anybody want to jump in? Yeah. 
Thanks, Ricardo. Um, uh, I guess two things. One is, I think, there's an element of that in some of the sort of strand one work that I was talking about, uh, where particularly outside of bits of geography and planning, often there is an equating of comparing cities with comparing city governments. Uh, and that is much more about that kind of um, formal equivalence. And again, that work carries on. And if you read the Journal of Urban Affairs, for example, it publishes regularly comparisons between cities that are really just comparisons between city governments. Um, I'm not particularly wedded to the notion of planetary urbanization. This notion about the kind of global urban interface, this kind of making of the global through the urban, uh, this, make, this notion about the world and the city and the city and the world, I, that kind of relational thinking I think is fruitful and does move us away from the object of the city. And so smart urbanism or smart urbanization seems to be interesting as a set of processes. That doesn't mean to say thinking about a policy called the smart cities and worth doing. That's a different, that's an empirical question, not one about conceptualizing the urban. And it seems to me that part of what's driven, part of what's driven the new turn towards comparison is this sense about the, the future of the planet being made or unmade or remade through cities and through the urban experience. You know, and that's probably why we've got interested in comparative urban studies over the last 20 years, I would say. Um, yeah, I, I, I like this question. Um, so yeah, yeah. But I would, I would say two things about it. The first is um, bring up the idea of intra-urban comparison when we're thinking about stuff. So the cities where I've done work, the cities where I've done work before, places like Toronto, Chicago, London, Atlanta, New York, that label, right, do, you know, does a lot of work. It covers a lot of ground. But to think about Toronto, for example, from downtown Toronto is a very different way of seeing Toronto than thinking it, thinking about it from the inner suburbs or thinking it, thinking about it from the developing uh, post-suburban fringe of the city. And the, again, the way that we engage places like that, whether it's Toronto, Chicago, or elsewhere, it is an intuitive form of intra-urban comparison. And I think there's part of, part, of, um, part of the question here is asking us to push beyond, I think what, uh, Tom Sieverts has a nice kind of quote in Cities Without Cities, like where he says that uh, historical love for the old city blinds us to the realities of what's going on um, in the hinterland where the, you know, the majority of urbanization worldwide is taking place in these in-betweens, in, um, these in-between urban landscapes that are palimpsests of different forms of hyper-planned and unplanned and unregulated spaces which are evolving in really interesting and unique ways but they tend to get overlooked by not just the equation of the city with city government but city with our particular normative understanding of centrality and density and, you know, and these types of um, urban phenomena. So I think one of the questions that you know, ties to smartness is how do we think about the applicability of smart technologies beyond individual buildings or corridors or cities to say, well, how, do, how are smart technologies and programs implemented in areas where there is a different degree of institutional and infrastructural thickness? We have to negotiate uh, a variety of um, territorialized forms of governance against this distinct from Singapore than elsewhere, perhaps, but in city regions in North America that I'm familiar with, you have to kind of start grappling with the need for the city, the urban, to bring in a, a variety of um, governmental and non-governmental stakeholders. So firstly, I think you're, you're grappling with this question forces us to ask the question that my students hate me asking, so what is the city, what is the urban, when we're thinking about these types of questions? So having that intra-urban comparative moment, where we are thinking from matters. Um, a second thing I just want to say, like, a, a short thing on planetary urbanization, which, um, I think it's a bad rap and has a lot of baggage associated with it, but I think it's an argument which has made a particular level of generality that does comparative work. And it's a type of comparison which is a little bit out of favor with some of these conversations around global urban studies because it's an encompassing form of comparison. It wants to bring places into dialogue with overarching processes. And if we're thinking about urban processes, we're connecting places, cities as expressions of underlying you know, forms of urban development, urbanization, and the city is one articulation of this, but it's not the only one. 
but planetary urbanization is getting us to think about connectivities, relational ties that bring places into an encompassing form of comparison rather than one which is thinking about variation or particularity. And while that's a little bit out, a bit out of favor, I think that's important work that is doing a particular kind of argument. And so the overarching well, we have a question here is, is, what is the point of comparison? What are you trying to compare and why are you comparing it? And you know, I think planetary urbanization, while I'm not necessarily you know, completely wedded to it, I think it does a lot of useful and generative work by bringing um, that kind of encompassing logic to the comparative work that we're doing. And in a sense, you can think of it as a multi-site case study as much as a comparative bringing together of stuff, but it gets us to that focus on theoretical constructs, processes and relations beyond cities as objects of analysis, however we abstract them. Thanks, JP. Um, guys, it's not a competition, but the people on Zoom are outshining the people in the room, okay? Um, so please be mindful of this. Um, okay, next up, we do have a question from, from uh, we've got one online, then maybe we can come, come to you, okay? Um, we've got a question from Jane M. Jacobs. Um, Jane, I'm not sure if you want to ask it yourself, or I can paraphrase it for you if you prefer. Yes, we can, and see oh, great. you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. It's a really interesting uh, panel, so thank you very much uh, for convening it. Um, I think, actually, my question is a little bit of a, a flow-on or a version of what Ricardo just asked, which is, you know, what, why does geography worry uh, about comparative comparativism and comparative thinking? Um, why does it feel impelled towards it um, as, a, as a kind of... Um, uh, a methodological uh, good um, and you know and I in the question online I sort of say well you know there's a post west you know post development you know post um, you know pr uh, core kind of uh, logic to that but I wonder whether it relates a little bit to our case study methodology the dominance of that within our work and e even um, uh, within the work we do when we talk about comparative uh, thinking and think about it critically, we don't really engage um, very um, with much faith, for example, with uh, work that uses methodologies of indices, uh, the variables, and yet we use variables, we've been talking about variables all the time. So we sort of imagine that the indices work where you might compare indices across you know, various sites, um, as somehow complicit with the wrong kind of global thinking. Whereas I just wonder whether we we need to be, I'm just wondering whether there's a relationship between our case study approach and whether if we were just a little bit more methodologically diverse, we could be uh, reframing this uh, comparative question. We might even not be so bothered by that comparative question. And I think it relates a little bit to the relationality that uh, Ricardo's question sort of uh, flushed out a little bit uh, through the answers of JP and others. Thanks, Jane. Um, when I summarized that question in my notes, I put why jog obsessed? Um, so <laughs> why are we so obsessed with comparison? Um, do you guys want to have a stab at it? Or should we have one more, bring in one more question from the floor? And then maybe we can answer both of them or address both of them at the same time? Yeah, so do you wanna come up and? Hi, uh, thank you so much for this discussion. Uh, it was really interesting. My name is Jong Hak. I'm a PhD student at NUS, uh, working with uh, Sean and Tim. So I have actually two questions that might sound naive. Uh, the first question is that the, uh, I wanted to ask how important the narrative of global north and south uh, when it comes to conducting the, this kind of knowledge production in comparative urbanism. Uh, I know that the, uh, this is like uh, one of the uh, major endeavors for the academic decolonization and all, but especially when it comes to smart, uh, conducting like comparative urbanism, when it comes to like, smart urbanism, basically, smart cities. Uh, the, the concept of smartness has not, it's been so extensively uh, produced all over the world to the extent that it's not really, I don't know, uh, congregated or uh, explicit to a certain regions. So basically, can we, for example, compare Stockholm and Taipei uh, or, or Taipei or Seoul as two random cities instead of saying, oh, this is a comparison of the global north and global south or south-south comparison. So that's one, one of my questions because 
uh, even in the morning when we had uh, like this very productive uh, presentation by uh, Eric and Elga, uh, uh, they also emphasized the uh, importance of launch production through this South-South comparison. So that was my first question. And second question, which is I think way more concise, is what makes, uh, how can you justify a comparison of two different cities? Like, uh, if this is about gen uh, generating two uh, new conceptual insights, uh, what makes it, uh, what can you, uh, how can you say that comparing A and B is, I don't know, logically, I don't know, more rational than comparing A and C, for example? So how do you actually uh, come up with this kind of justification uh, of these comparative studies? So these are two questions. Great, thank you. Um, so we've got three questions in the mix. Uh, if I can just recap, firstly, Jane Jacobs, why are geographers so obsessed? And then obviously there is a methodological, even a disciplinary lineage to this. Um, and, and you know, to, to think around that. Um, and then John Han's two questions. Uh, one about the importance of the, the global north, and then the second about justification of the selection of cities uh, for comparison. Um, I'm going to take your question first. Um, it was really interesting. I, I don't like using these terms, global north and global south. It's shorthand. It's very messy. Uh, so I take the point. I'm trying to figure out other, way, other terms to use. Um, there's a very nice book published last year by Garth Myers, who's a prof at Trinity College in Connecticut. And he argued in the book uh, he laid out seven case studies arguing that the global south is everywhere. What we think of as the global south exists in every global north city. So he compared uh, aspects of Hartford to, you know, Zanzibar and uh, I don't know, other, I can't remember the other case studies. Um, but it really made me think, like, it made me think there are examples in the global, so called global north. Uh, in my own country, especially now that I'm starting to look at indigenous uh, issues and uh, land grabbing and for for smart city projects, I think there are definitely parallels. And like what I alluded to earlier about the indigenous issues in Canada and uh, in Johor, there's definitely interesting parallels. Um, we have our own failed smart city project in Canada that I think is kind of interesting to potentially compare with other smart cities. Uh, we were, I guess, I guess we have robust public discourse and I, I don't know, democracy that fended it off, but we were very, very close to having a Google subsidiary create a smart city uh, on the edge of Toronto. So I think your point's well taken, lots to think about. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just uh, follow up on, on, on Sarah's points. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, personally, for me, I, I think comparative urbanism and geography, uh, you know, emerged partially out of the post-colonial urbanism tradition, where, of course, scholars like Jenny Robinson, as well as Ananya Roy, uh, Colin McFarlane, you know, um, have been quite influential in, in, in helping us understand it from that point of view. So there is, there is a certain sense whereby people might say that, oh, you know, comparative urbanism is one way in which we're trying to equalize, you know, the, the north-south uh, divide or the northern bias in, in, in geography in general. Uh, personally, I think that's important, but, but personally, from my own work, I, I'm trying to move beyond that. I'm, 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 trying, to, I'm trying to see you know, whether comparative urbanism is, is, can move beyond just a unidirectional corrective uh, and whether we can you know, um, basically create conversations between cases or processes, uh, both in the global north and south. I, I, I'm reminded of a really nice paper by John May and his colleagues um, in 2012, I think it was titled uh, Keeping London Global, where he, he, he showed uh, a more ordinary side to London. So London, for so long, you know, uh, being thought of as the heartland of you know, urban theory or global theory, you know, there, there is an ordinary side to London as well. So I think, I think once we peel back these statuses from cities, which of course exist and still are influential in how we theorize and understand cities, um, I think then, you know, Every other city can then be an ordinary city, right? To use Jennifer Robinson's parlance in helping us uh, build comparison, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a south-south comparison or a south-to-north, you know, reverse direction. Of course, those things all matter and they're good. But I think 
more broadly, we can you know, open up comparative urbanism to just being beyond a post-colonial urbanism project per se. Um, and I think I just want to quickly answer Chong Hak's second question as well, is how do we justify uh, comparative urbanism? I think a lot of it is, is very personal, uh, just as you do um, you know, single case study research, like Jane mentioned, um, you all, every single scholar has his or her own personal agendas when doing single case study research. When you're doing comparative research, I think you have your own personal agendas as well. For example, if you are doing South-South research, it could be a deliberate attempt to circumvent the North in the production of urban theory. Right? If in my case, you know, I'm, I'm deliberately going back and forth between the North and South, it could be my attempt to try to you know, move beyond that unidirectional corrective. So I think there are many ways to justify it, but you know, the two general ways in which the literature has done it is to justify it based on repeated instances, like Kevin mentioned, so in a genetic form of comparison, or in my own work, you know, a, a more generative form whereby we justify comparing different cases based on their shared features, such as they are collaborative urban experiments, such as their mega urban projects, because these features are features of the urban and they're found anywhere, you know, notwithstanding global north, south, east, or, or west, in that sense, yeah. Go for it, JP. Um, I'd, I would have touched on probably, uh, probably all of the questions, but uh, I think uh, first, firstly, uh, to Jane's question about why geographers are interested in comparison, I think it kind of, it goes with the territory, like geographers are interested in space and place, so the smart city doesn't happen on the head of a pin, it occurs in like different places, and the fact that you can look at them spatially is intrinsically interesting. And I think if you have a geographic imaginary, that kind of comes with the territory, which perhaps is a, maybe that's dodging the question or, or putting a bit of essentialism in terms of how we think about things geographically. But I also want to, you know, as is my want at the moment, bring uh, a quick kind of question of temporality in here to take seriously some of, uh, uh, I think, some of what James suggested in terms of expanding our comparative toolkits. And on one hand, I think, I was, I was re-familiarizing myself with Gillian Hart's um, relational comparative approach on, on the way in, and it's something which resonates with me a lot because it uses my favorite book, which is Bertel Ullman's Dance of Di Dialectic, to think about you know, actually you know, just looking around, stepping back, projecting forward, which is at like, a temporal moment, and I think which is, that's something which is useful to operationalize, again, the type of conjunctural analysis that we're thinking about. But I've also been thinking uh, recently about Lefebvre's river rhythm analysis, and a slightly different approach to repetition than kind of seeing repeated instances occurring kind of geographically, um, especially with like smart technologies. So the, the idea that you have repetition as a recurring event which produces difference by the fact that something happens after another. So a bus comes and another bus comes, but the second bus is different because it exists in relation to the first, and that's how we kind of produce difference through time. So in our kind of looking back and projecting forward, that notion of repetition, repeated instances in place, even if it's this ostensibly the same thing happening again, is an interesting way to think about the, um, the, the generation, the evolution of things in space and in time. We can also think about this in terms of policy cycles, um, seasonal cycles, questions of the day and the night in the smart city. So again, kind of pushing to that else whens as well as where on a variety of different scales from like diurnal things to seasonal. Um, and that brings us to kind of the, a, a broad sense of temporal progression, which is periodization. So going to the question about COVID and post-COVID, well, how do, we, how do we know we are in a post-COVID era? Um, two years down the line, it might just end up being a blip like the global financial crisis, where in a lot of instances, like thinking about what's happening at my university, they're doing their best to make our experience of educational academic life exist as if COVID never happened. It's like, get back to what you were doing before, ignore, you know, no masking, get back in the classroom. Uh, you know, Zoom exists in the background, it's kind of a, a fail safe if you can't kind of do something but post your lectures online. Um, but that question of periodization is one of abstraction. And how do you draw that kind of delineation between what's pre and what's post COVID? Like, is, does it make sense to have that kind of analytical distinction? And if we think about the process of periodization that enables us to have another kind of comparative vector between what happens before and what happens after and how do we approach the distinction of continuities and ruptures both within and between cases. Fantastic, Can, um, Kevin, anything to add or you're gonna sit this one out? 
sensible. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I want to, to come back to um, what something that actually Kevin mentioned in his uh, opening remarks to my first question, which is, um, in his view, it's very healthy to have this idea of unruly comparisons. Um, and I want to use that point as a jumping off block to, to invite uh, Nai Wong Shao, who is on Zoom, uh, to ask a question about the selection of cities and how we're actually choosing what to compare. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm Shao Nai Rong. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can, yeah. Um, thank you. I, uh, I graduated from uh, Chiang Mai University of Thailand. I, I did my research by, uh, on transnational Chinese in the context of uh, Thailand in Chiang Mai. So uh, now I'm, I'm interested in about the comparative research um, in the bigger context in Southeast Asia context. So um, my question is that if I want to compare uh, uh, transnational Chinese in the context of Southeast Asia um, uh, in the related to BRI, like uh, uh, Belt and Road in Initiative. So is that possible that I select Singapore and, um, and, and Bangkok? Uh, as the as the two cities to compare, uh, or I can compare uh, Singapore and Chiang Mai. I I know that um, from 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 the discussion just now, right? I I I know that we need to think about similarity and, and differences between the uh, cities. But uh, what in my mind is that. Um, for the Singapore part, if I want to select Singapore as a as a as a target city to compare, um, for me, I have been doing the BRI related research for two and a half uh, as, a, as a research assistant uh, for a professor in Chiang Mai University. Um, for me, I think Singapore is a BRI city or a BRI country, but but for some of the scholars, they might they might uh, not think in this way as I, as I think. So, but for Thailand, in Thailand's part, um, I, I'm not sure if, if I can uh, compare Bangkok as the capital city compared with Singapore, or I can select Chiang Mai as the, like, maybe, maybe second tier of, uh, second tier city of Thailand compared with Chiang, uh, compared with Singapore. So, so, um, my question is that I, I don't know uh, what, what is the criteria to, to select. For me, I, I, I select those cities, but I don't, I don't know if my criteria is, is, the, is reached the standard. <laughs> do, do, do you get Yep. That's great. Thank you. Um, any more? So I think we, we've got about six or so minutes left on the clock. So are there any more questions from uh, the room that you're desperately like to ask before we finish? No? Tim, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a microphone there as well, if you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks, everyone. Just really, really great lineup of uh, speakers and I've really enjoyed listening to your responses. Almost all the responses have, uh, have been um, with regard to your experiences as individual researchers that have carried out forms of comparative urban studies. But the project that brings us together here for this Smart Cities is a, is a collaborative project. And so perhaps um, just as a final thing to reflect on, I'm sure we'll have other chances to talk about this, but um, do any of you have any um, experiences to share about the pitfalls and and promises of doing comparative research uh, collaboratively um, rather than just as a lone researcher looking at more than one site, whether that be a city or some other uh, unit of time or space. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. So two questions, one about the selection of sites of comparison and different tiers of cities within a country and, and how you compare those with other cities. Um, and then Tim's question about the, the actual promises and pitfalls of, of comparative research, which I, I think you know, sort of feeds into a question that I wanted to end with, uh, which I'll just put in there into the mix, which is you know, fundamentally, what does good comparative research look like? Uh, you know, and what sort of outcomes does it lead to? Um, 
you and I passed on the last one. I figure I should start with this one. Um, um, so to the first question on Zoom, um, I guess I would... All, I mean, and it also echoes Jane M. Jacobs' question we, of what is it a case study of? And so there are vectors of similarity and difference. And so looking at BRI in different places, locations, cities, if that's your objective analysis, that would lead you to make some decisions. If your comparison is of something else that happens to be related to BRI and its relationships, that would be a different set of comparisons. So in a sense, I think it's being clear about what it is you think your case study, because Jane talked about case studies, stands in for. And it's always about a shorthand, whether it's a policy, a neighbourhood, a community, or, or something called a city. So I guess that would, I mean, that's just a, a weak way of saying, actually, you need to think carefully about what are you thinking about a case study of before you select what your case studies are. Um, and what was the other thing I was going to say? I can't remember what I was going to say. So Tim's, Tim's point, I guess, as someone who's never been involved in a multi-team comparison... What I would, but having read reviews of them and review, <laughs> refereed them, seems to me that one of the challenges of us involved in the current project around smart cities is this un notion of unruliness, is about how much is knowable in advance and how those parameters are set. Because again, the reports from the different cities, without getting into the room or on Zoom, who probably haven't read all these reports, there are lots of differences and similarities and actually not knowing everything and actually being open to that unruliness, the openness, I think is generative. But then that comes back to what it is you're comparing and having some kind of sense about what that might mean. And that's what I mean about the difference between something called a smart city and something, or resilient city, or a, an age-friendly city, or the endless city, in fact, and, and actually what you're looking to do. Because in a sense, those terms really just stand in for a set of relationships and conjunctures and connections. And that seems to me the more interesting thing to compare. Partly because they then bring into comparison times and spaces between those locations. Um, I just wanted to comment on uh, Tim's question about the promises and pitfall pitfalls. Uh, I have three points. Uh, one is just the general challenge of multi-sided research and giving everywhere a fair shake, I guess. Uh, and uh, the second relates to that in the sense that I speak Malay and slash Indonesian. I don't speak Arabic. <laughs> um, and so I think the potential that I see in my own work is to collaborate with people who speak multiple languages and can get at individual projects from multiple directions. So for example, I've worked on Forest City, which is a Chinese development. I don't speak Mandarin. Uh, and my Indonesian and Malay is pretty useless because all the workers are from Bangladesh and the management's from you know, China and the private security force is from Nepal, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So there's huge scope for really interesting combinations of people who speak different languages. Uh, and then th the final point is uh, finding locals to partner with has been really hard uh, in the work that I do because no one wants to write critically about a lot of these <laughs> projects that are, you know, the pet projects of authoritarian states. So particularly in the Gulf, but also in Johor, people are very cautious. Um, so that's, that's sort of a challenge, ongoing challenge. Sean, you've got one minute. Yep, I'll just do it really quickly. I'll, I'll, I'll actually address your question, what makes um, good comparative research. I'll say two points. The first is that good comparative research uh, creates concepts that add nuance or goes above and beyond what we already have. So we shouldn't be comparing for the sake of comparing just because it's sexy, just because it's nice to jump on the bandwagon. right? So we need to make sure that good concepts come out and we... The second thing, which is really, really important for me personally, is that good comparative urbanism must demonstrate a positive link between the method and the outcome. Right, we've been sitting here today talking about comparative urbanism, but we haven't actually talked about how to do comparative urbanism. So to me, that, that is something that I'm still looking at um, as, as a researcher, you know, even as a student, which is you know, literally what are the steps to take, what can we take, and of course, a lot of it is the unruliness that, that, that Kevin was talking about, but I think a lot of it was, is also about 
creating a particular system where you know it can help you actually operationalize the comparative research. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sean. Um, okay, so we're officially out of time. Um, everybody, please join me in thanking our four wonderful uh, panelists for sharing their thoughts. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And, uh, you know, let's look forward to continuing the conversations over the next couple of days. Thank you.